Crossroads Church has entered a period of transition. We'll be looking forward in the months and year or so ahead to who God has already appointed to maintain the leadership of Crossroads Church. And so when we talk about transition, we are talking about change. However, I want us as a congregation to remember, even though we go through a period of transition, there are some things that cannot change, some things that will not change. And so for a few weeks before the Christmas season, I want to bring a series of messages on beyond transition or things that never change. Today, the Word. The Word of God can never change, and the Word of God is extremely important. In fact, it's imperative that you understand the importance of God's Word, because the Word, God's Word, is involved with your salvation. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, we read, For you have been born again through the living and enduring, everyone, Word of God. It's important for your salvation. The word is important for your growth in Christ-likeness. John 17, verse 17. Make them holy by thy truth. Your word is truth. It's important for your usefulness. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. A workman who correctly handles the word of truth. And it's important for your assurance. 1 John 5, 13, I write the words. I write these things to you so that you may know that you have eternal life. It is rather interesting the importance of God's word in the word itself. When you begin to think of it, the very last thought or actually second to the last thought in your Bible concerns the word. The very last thought is, behold, I come quickly. But you'll also find in Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19, here's the last bit of instruction that we have in all of Scripture. I give fair warning to you all who hear the words of the prophecy of this book. If you add to the words of this prophecy, God will add to your life the disasters written in this book. If you subtract from the words of the book, of this prophecy, God will subtract your part from the tree of life and the holy city that are written in this book. The very last thought we have here, next to the very last thought in the scripture itself is the importance of God's word. So matter whatever happens in your life or the life of the church, one thing that must never change is the importance of the word that we hold the word high because the word can be trusted. This morning, I want to share with you five reasons that I believe the word of God can be challenged, can be, can be uh, trusted, and uh, doesn't have to be challenged. First of all, the word of God can be trusted because of its scientific accuracy. And you may say just a minute here, that I, uh, be careful what you're saying because has not science always attacked the word? And that is somewhat true, that science has always tried to prove that the Word of God is in error. In W.A. Criswell's book, uh, The Bible for Today's World, he refers to the French Academy of Science that in 1861 published a brochure entitled 51 Scientific Facts, Facts that Prove the Bible is in Error. And it's rather interesting that today you can't find one legitimate scientist who believes any of these so-called facts that were to prove the er erroneousness of the Bible. Science uh, finally realized that Scripture is more important than science, or we might say that uh, that science finally caught up with the Scriptures. Uh, Take, for example, the whole area of cosmology. As you study the earth's position, and I would ask you, well, you know, what is the position of the earth? And you would say, well, the earth is floating in space. Now, you know that, and I know that because we are taught that in school. And uh, the Armstrong and some of the, the uh, astronauts have come back, and they've been up there, and they look down, and they will confirm the fact the earth is floating in space. But, you see, man hasn't always thought that. 
In the Egyptian uh, history, you'll find the Egyptians felt that the earth was resting on top of four pillars. Greeks also had a rather interesting um, understanding of the earth. They uh, felt that the earth is resting on the back of a, a human being, a giant, a strong, strong man whose name is Atlas. Yeah. Uh, of course, the Egyptians were wrong and the Greeks were wrong, but um, even the ancient writings of the Hindu, Hindu ancient writings were very interesting because they taught that the world is resting on top of an elephant. And uh, the question came, well, if the world is sitting on top of the elephant, you know, what is the elephant standing on? And the answer was a gigantic turtle. So the question was, well, if the world is sitting on top of the elephant and the elephant on top of the turtle, what is the turtle standing on? And they said, the turtle is resting on a giant coiled snake. And of course, the next question was, well, what is the snake resting on? And the answer was, the snake is swimming in a cosmic sea. Well, eventually, science... Uh, caught up with the Bible. And we know today from science and we know from space experience that the world is not resting on top of a man or resting on four pillars or on top of a huge elephant, but rather the world is floating in space. And so finally we might say science caught up with the Bible because the Bible has always taught that way back in the Old, Old Testament in one of the oldest writings to be found, namely the book of Job, chapter 26, verse 7. God's Word says He suspends the earth over nothing. Or the message paraphrase says He hangs the earth out in empty space. Science has caught up with the Bible, because you can trust the Bible. I take, secondly, the idea of the earth's shape. What shape is the earth? And of course, for years we know that people felt the earth world was flat, and you had to be very careful lest you might fall off the edge of the earth. But there came a man who began to question that, a man who we think is so important that when his birthday comes around, we close our schools and we close our banks and we celebrate this particular person, whose name is Christopher Columbus. It's rather interesting if you remember as we studied prophecy that Christopher Columbus was a believer and wrote a book about biblical prophecy. Obviously, he understood the Scriptures. And Christopher Columbus proved that the earth was not flat because he believed the Scripture and he wasn't afraid of going off the edge because God's Word says in Isaiah 40, verse 22, he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. Now, it's rather interesting if you look at the Hebrew, your Hebrew Bible, you'll find actually a better translation of that word in the Hebrew is sphere or globe. So we have way back here in the Old Testament, in the writings of Isaiah, I should say, that the earth is a sphere. The Bible has always been there, and finally, after years, science caught up with the Scriptures. Or take the number of stars, for example. Um, Hipparchus was a um, Greek philosopher, or Greek astronomer, and uh, spent much time studying the stars. Hipparchus made a chart of the, of the universe that he saw, and he numbered the stars, and he wrote a scientific fact that because he saw them and he numbered them, we know that there are 1,022 stars in the universe. That was scientific fact for 250 years. Then after 250 years, another man, Claudius Ptolemy, came along. And Ptolemy was also an astronomer. He was a Roman, interesting enough, a Roman citizen of Egypt who wrote in Greek. Isn't that interesting? He was Roman, 
Egyptian and Greek. All that came together, but he was a brilliant man, and he studied the stars and came up with his own chart, and he said that Hipparchus was wrong. There were not. In fact, he laughed at the fact there were 1,022 stars. Come on. He said, I have studied it. I have charted it out, and there are not 1,022 stars. There are 1,026 stars. There are four more than has been stated, and that remains science fact for 300 years. Then came a medical student, and a medical student who eventually became an astronomer, but the medical student invented the first telescope, and he was able to see beyond what the other men had seen with their naked eye, and his name was Galileo. Galileo made the very first telescope that supposedly looked just like this one you're seeing. And so he could see far more, and he came up with the answer, as far as the number of stars in the universe is concerned, you cannot number them. There's a big question mark. No one can. Today, the idea is there are at least, if not more than 12 octillion stars. And you say, what is an octillion? Someone has said, well, an octillion is more than the grains of sand on the seashores of the world. Think about that. I mean, just go to, uh, to a seashore around here somewhere and uh, count. Well, you can't even count. I mean, the sands are beyond the ability for us to count. But then think of all the world and all the seashores of the world doesn't even compare with the amount of stars in the sky. So finally, you see, science caught up with the Bible because the Bible, which can be trusted, said way back in Leviticus chapter, or rather uh, Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 22, you cannot number the stars in the sky. It was there all the time, but we had to work and try our own way at things, and yet the Bible was always the Bible of the word that was true even in science. Very interesting. Well, let's move from cosmology to um, biology. In biology, you have the whole idea of the circulation of blood. You may remember that, that at one time, the belief was that the blood contains sickness. And so you had a period of time in history where uh, you had barber shops. The barber shops originally were a place where they would bleed people. And so when you see this, this pole outside the barbershop, you'll notice the pole has red and white. Sometimes they've added blue, but that's a pole. And the reason it's red and white is because it goes back to the origin of the barbershop, which was a place where you, they would bleed people. That's the red of the pole, and the white was the bandage. And so we have it even today, which reminds us of the, you know, of the beginning. That's what it was all about, because they felt that the blood was a place where sickness resided, and of course, some Sickness is in the blood, but uh, they believed it all was there, and so you had the barbershops where they would bleed people. Uh, president Washington, the first president of the United States, was very ill, and they felt indeed the sickness was the blood, and he went to the barbershop, and he was bled. They bled him, and then he didn't get better, so they bled him a second time, and he didn't improve, so they bled him a third time, and that brought about his death. Washington died because of the belief that uh, the blood housed all the sickness and the bleeding didn't seem to help him. But there came along a man called William Harvey. And in 1615, he discovered the circulation of blood. And he discovered that the blood is circulating through our body, it's pumped by the heart, and that the life we have is in the blood. And when he taught that, finally, you see, science caught up with the Bible, because the Bible has always said that. Even though we had all kinds of theories, the Bible has said way back in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 14, the life of every creature is its blood. You can trust the Bible. I think, for example, also the need for quarantine. You know, in the 14th century, there was the Black Plague in Europe, and you know the Black Plague wiped out one-third of the population. The people didn't know what to do. Medicine had no answer, and so the church came forth, and the church gave the answer which brought an end to the plague. The church, of course, went back to God's Word, and finally medicine caught up with God's Word, 
as re revealed in Leviticus chapter 13, verse 46. As long as he has the infection, he remains unclean. He must live alone. He must live outside the camp. And when in Europe they began to practice quarantine, the plague ended because science caught up with the Bible. Finally, think about the washing of hands. The whole germ theory of disease is often attributed to Louis Pasteur. And yet, um, that really is not the origin of this. There was a man before him. Pasteur, you recall, was French, but there was a man who was a Hungarian physician by the name of Semmelweis. And Semmelweis um, found out that disease was being transferred through hands that were not being washed. In fact, in the maternity ward of his hospital there, he's Viennese, that uh, one out of every six mothers died. And so Samuel Weiss discovered that um, if the doctors would wash their hands, and he, and he uh, concocted a medication or a hand-washing a liquid called of chlorinated lime solutions, and he said, if you would wash your hands with this before you examine a patient, you will not spread disease. What was happening, as you may remember from your history, is that doctors would perform autopsies, and then they would go to the hospital and perform exams, and they would transfer disease to the patient, and one out of every six of the mothers was dying. They began to practice Samuel Weiss's um, idea and the uh, death rate went from one out of six to one in 84. But it's rather interesting as you study the history of medicine that medicine wasn't willing to accept that. And so uh, Samuel Weiss was considered insane. He was committed to an insane asylum and he died there of a physical disease. Then Louis Pasteur came along, and he revived the idea. And finally, uh, in time, uh, medicine caught up with the Bible because the Bible is very clear about washing in relation to disease. Numbers 19, verses 14 through 21. But look at verse 19. The person being cleansed must wash his clothes and bathe in water. If we had time, I would read the passage. It teaches there clearly the importance of washing. And of course, once science caught up with the Bible, things have been totally different in the medical world. The Bible can be trusted. And I trust the Bible because of its scientific accuracy. It's not a book of science, but whenever it touches on science, it is totally accurate. Secondly, I believe that we can trust the Bible because of its historical accuracy. Now think in terms of the writing of Moses. If you were to go down the street and ask someone, have you heard of the Ten Commandments? Most likely they would say yes. And if you ask them, well, what, what Old Testament patriarch is associated with the Ten Commandments? Many, I think, would say Moses, because Moses goes along with the Ten Commandments. But many people don't realize that Moses was also the author of the first five books of the Bible, that the Bible teaches that he wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But the historians came along and said, you know, that's not true. There was no possibility of Moses ever doing that because writing hadn't been invented in his time. So how could he write five books if writing hadn't even, wasn't even in existence during that period of time? And that's what historians believed and historians taught until the Armana letters were discovered. The Amana's letters were discovered in Upper Egypt by e local Egyptians in 1887, and they found their correspondence between Egypt and Palestine before Moses was even born. And once that was discovered, they had a hard time saying that Moses could not have written the Pentateuch because writing wasn't in existence. Of course it was. And once again, now we have history, historians catching up with the Bible. And then take also, for example, the kingship of Bel Belshazzar. Remember in Daniel 5, the hand that came and started to write on the wall and, and that whole experience? And if you read uh, that chapter, uh, it says that Belshazzar was the king. However, the historians said, no, that's wrong. Nabonidus was the king. He was the last king of Babylonia or Babylon. 
So the historian said, you know, Belshazzar wasn't the king. The Bible is wrong. Then, of course, the archaeologists did their work, and um, they found that, uh, <clears throat> indeed, Belshazzar was king. Actually, he was the co-regent. There were two kings. And one was the father, and one was the son. And the Bible speaks particularly of Belshazzar, the son, here. In fact, when you begin to understand what the Bible's talking about, you begin to see why in Daniel 5, 16, Daniel was offered the position of the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Normally, you think it would be the second, but you see there were co-regents as king. The Scripture's right, and that's why he was offered the third position. Oh, my friends, a history is often, historians have also caught up with the Scriptures because when the Bible touches on science, it's accurate. When the Bible touches on history, it is accurate. And the third reason I believe you can trust the Bible is because of its thematic accuracy or its unity. Remember, as you consider the Bible, there is one theme, one theme all throughout in that salvation. There is one hero, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is one a villain, and that is Satan, all the way through. And you might say, well, what's so great about that? I mean, there are thousands upon thousands of books that have been written with one theme and one hero and one villain. But remember this about the Bible that it's totally unique. <clears throat> the Bible is one book, but it's really 66 books written by 40 different authors over 1,600 years of time in 13 countries and three continents of different backgrounds from the lowly shepherd to the high king, and uh, more than one langu language was used. And yet you put all this together, and you have one basic theme, and one basic hero, and one basic villain, all the way through from Genesis to Revelation. Everything fits. It's, the, it's miraculous, of course. It's God's Word. There is no other book like that in all of history. It never has been, and there never will be. The Bible is totally unique, and the Bible can be trusted because even though it's 66 books by 40 authors over 1,600 years, there is that total theme all the way through. The same hero, the same villain. You can trust the Bible. And fourthly this morning, I believe the Bible can be trusted because of its prophetic accuracy. As you look at Scripture, you find Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled in the New Testament. Take Scripture as a whole. <clears throat> Old Testament prophecies fulfilled in the New Testament. And as you look at the prophecies of the Old Testament and you see them fulfilled in the New Testament, there is perfect accountability. It's 100% perfect. There is no other, quote, prophecy book like it where it's 100% accurate. And it's rather interesting that 300-plus prophecies in the Old Testament are about Jesus Christ, and all of them are fulfilled in the New Testament to perfection, totally perfection. The Bible is perfect. Well, what about the skeptic? It's rather interesting to, to read about the skeptics and, and what they say about this. I mean, how can you argue when you have an Old Testament prophecy that is fulfilled in the New Testament just exactly as the Old Testament prophet said hundreds of years before Christ was even born? Well, the skeptics say this, that Jesus was a man just like I'm a man or a human being just like you and I who understood the Old Testament. So what he did with the understanding of the Old Testament is he arranged his life in such a way so that he would fulfill what all the Old Testament prophesied. He arranged the fulfillment. And you can kind of laugh at that, but in a sense, you see, he did arrange it. See, hundreds of years before he was ever born, 
he arranged that Micah would prophesy that he would be born in Bethlehem. Hundreds of years before he was born, he arranged with Isaiah to give the details of Christ's birth and his death. 750 years before Christ was even born. Of course he arranged it. He arranged with the psalmist to write in Psalm 22 that when Jesus comes, he would die the death of a crucifixion, even though at the time the psalmist wrote it, crucifixion was not used for capital punishment. Jesus arranged it hundreds of years before he was born. And also he arranged that the Roman government would uh, crucify him on a cross. Hundreds of years before Christ came, he arranged that a rich man would be nearby at the crucifixion and that Jesus would be buried in the rich man's tomb. He arranged it hundreds of years before he came. And he arranged it with Zechariah to prophesy that Christ would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. And the New Testament obviously tells us that all came true. Oh, Christ arranged things, all right, and he arranged that not only would he die and be buried, but he would rise again, and he arranged it so that he would come alive. He would be alive and is alive forevermore. He arranged it, and God's people said, amen. He arranged it all, and so prophecy is accurate, and we can trust our Bible because the prophecies are true. Well, one more thought this morning. <clears throat> I believe the Bible can be trusted because of its powerful authority. It is authoritative. The Bible above any other book is a Bible of authority. When our children were young, we taught them that, that Scripture can be trusted, that what the Lord teaches in Scripture is absolute truth. It's His authority, and we want to live by those principles. We ingrained that in our kids when they were very young. When uh, they were preschool age, we lived in New Jersey, and we lived next door to the church where there was a huge parsonage, a very beautiful parsonage uh, with a couple thousand feet upstairs and a big basement. And, of course, in New Jersey, you had cold winters, you had snow, and so the basement was a perfect place for the children to play. It wasn't finished, but there was a nice floor with tile, and uh, there was, they had a little bike, a little trike down there that they would run, ride around and had a great place to play in the wintertime. But you could kind of hear them. You couldn't see them, but you leave the door to the basement open, and you could hear that they were playing, and they were doing all right. Well, one day, my wife heard them playing down there, and uh, obviously our daughter, Julie, was very unhappy with Kevin, our son, because he wasn't sharing with her. And my wife heard our daughter finally say with great authority, Kevin, the Bible says share with one another. John 3, 16. <laughs> well, she had the idea, you know. Uh, the Bible is authoritative, and um, the Bible itself says way back there in Psalm 9, 119, 89, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in the heaven. It's the authoritative, settled word of God. You can trust it. But I say here, it's not just authoritative, it's powerful and its authority. Think about that, the power of the Word just in endurance, endurance of the Word itself. How over the years man has laughed at the Word and criticized the Word and uh, made fun of the Word and uh, in fact outlawed the Word. One time in Scottish history, it was a crime worthy of death to own a Bible. Man has tried time and time again to preach the funeral sermon for the Bible. The only problem is the corpse never died. He lives, the Bible lives, and it endures, endures century after century. No one can seem to bury the Word of God, for it endures. But it also is powerful in its sufficiency. Just think about that. <clears throat> the Bible is sufficient for the sinner. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God so loved the world, that whosoever believe it. It's sufficient. It's sufficient for the saved because at times we trip up and the Bible says, written to the Christian in 1 John, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us your sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's sufficient. 
is sufficient for the, the scholar. I, I've been thinking about that this week, you know. The Bible is so deep, there is so much there that scholar after scholar, century after century, can plumb the depths of the Scriptures but never reach the bottom. And so all the time commentaries are being printed. Men are earning their doctorates and doing dissertations and are digging deep in the Bible, and there's always more to be learned because it's sufficient for the scholar. But also it's sufficient for the sufferer. Basically all of us suffer. All of us suffer emotionally, physically, financially, And yet the Word of God is always there with sufficient power. I don't know what you're going through, but likely every one of us has something we're dealing with. And the Word of God says, you know, my grace is sufficient for you. That's the Word. And it is. It's powerful. It's powerful for the sufferer. The uh, Bible says, you know, um, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You might be going through a time when you're alone and you sense that everything's kind of oh, gone aside and you're standing there, but the Bible says, oh, remember, I will never leave you. That's powerful. Absolutely powerful. And the Bible says that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he will be with me. The Bible says that. You can grab a hold of that because the Bible can be trusted. It can be trusted. It is powerful. Well, in conclusion this morning, as you go from here and you go about your duties of this week, <clears throat> remember two things in particular. First of all, that, that God's Word is powerful for you, for you. That, that uh, someone has said um, that the Bible, this book, will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. The book, the Bible, is so powerful for you, and it can keep you from sin. It can, it can be the means by which you live the Christian life and you receive the strength to walk on with God in power and in strength. But above all this morning... <clears throat> Remember this, the Bible is a love story. It's a love story. It is not primarily a book of science, although when it touches on science, it is true. It's not primarily a book of history, but when it speaks of history, it is true. It's not primarily a book of prophecy, but whenever it speaks of prophecy, it is true. But above all, you see, it's a love story from Genesis all the way to Revelation. One theme, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the theme. Love all the way from Genesis to Revelation. It's just a love story. That's the greatest thing I can tell you this morning. It's a true love story. And although we trust it because of its scientific accuracy and its historical accuracy and its uh, thematic accuracy, its prophetic accuracy, we trust it most of all because of the power of the love of that God revealed to us in his word. There was a theologian. I'll show you his picture and uh, see if you can guess his name. Most people or many people look at that and say, oh, that's C.S. Lewis. But um, it's not C.S. Lewis. This is a picture of a man who um, was a theologian. Um, Pope Pius XII said that this Protestant theologian was the most important theologian since the time of Thomas Aquinas. Isn't that interesting? He has, was respected by the Catholic Church, and the Protestant Church. His name, as you probably have guessed, was Karl Barth. And Barth was a man who um, I think is misunderstood in many ways, but basically he attacked the liberalism in the German church or the German theology. 
and he presented a theology of the word. And so uh, at times I think he's been criticized, perhaps overly criticized, but the basic idea of Barth was the word and to trust the word. Bart was a prolific writer. He wrote what was called the Christian Dogmatics. If you go to seminary sometime, you'll be challenged to read them. There are the whole volume, volumes of books under the Christian Dogmatics, each volume between five and 700 pages. And when I was in seminary, we had to memorize all those books. Okay, so I lied. But anyway, uh, he wrote, it is estimated, millions of words So he read in his lifetime millions of words. He wrote millions of words. And in 1962, he came to the United States for a give a series of lectures. A reporter interviewed him. And so this reporter sat down with uh, Dr. Bart, this man who was respected by the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Church as one of the greatest theologians ever, man who wrote millions of words. And the, uh, and the interviewer said, now, Dr. Bart, you have written millions of words, and you've read millions of words. Uh, what, what would be the key statement that you have read or you have worked, w- written or you've thought in your years of reading and writing concerning the Bible. And it was in that context that Karl Barth said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's the Bible. Things may change. One thing that must never change is our stand on the Bible, God's love story. And I would ask you, um, what have you done with the love story? You might be here. You might be listening by the radio. You might uh, be watching one of our videos. I don't know where you're hearing this message, but let me ask you, wherever you are, What have you done with the love story? What have you done with Jesus, the hero of God's word? The Bible says, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The Bible is deep enough for every theologian never to reach the depths, and yet simple enough for a child to believe. Let's remember that. We need to approach the Bible with the simplicity of a child.